<coughs> friends, I'm now going to spend a few lectures on aluminum extraction. And I would put a lot of emphasis on aluminum because it is an extremely important metal. Not only a very important non-ferrous metal as such, but it in context of India's economy, aluminum is very important. India is fortunate that India has a lot of deposits of bauxite, aluminum ores. This is a plus point. The minus point is that aluminum extraction is extremely energy intensive because the metal is obtained by electrolysis of alumina dissolved in a molten salt called cryolite. Some 40 percent or more of the price of aluminum you pay is the price of electricity. And that electricity can come from thermal power plants or from hydroelectricity. Unfortunately, India is not rich in terms of energy. You see energy shortages everywhere. Energy is required for the industry, for domestic consumption, for running, pumping of water, for irrigation, and all kinds of things. Aluminum industry cannot have an easy access to as much energy as it likes. And yet, we have aluminum plants crying for expansion in our country because alumina is available, personnel is available, knowledge is available, successful plants are running which wants expansion, labor force is available, all conditions available but power is not available. Some of our successful aluminum plants are trying to set up aluminum plants abroad. Some may have already come up, like some in Vietnam. Vietnam has is a surplus energy country. They produce lot of hydroelectricity. You know, they have that river going through. Also, in places like Dubai, energy is no problem at all. There is already a plant called Dubal, Dubal Aluminum Company. They can import all the alumina they want. They can import all the technicians they want. They have the energy, they say they produce aluminum. In our country, we have everything, but not the energy. But India has to find an answer to this question. And how do we find the answer? Now, there was a time when India depended on cheap electricity from hydro projects. Remember the Hirakun Dam? Near Hirakun Dam, there is also an aluminum plant. The idea was the dam would produce hydroelectricity and give it to aluminum plant. Some aluminum plants were then allowed to set up their captive power plants, again based on coal thermal power plants, and they could use all the electricity they produced, and if they had a surplus, they could give it to the grid. Nalco, National Aluminum Company in Odisha, they have their own captive power plants. But now there is a hue and cry in this world about thermal power plants because they generate carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, they generate global warming glasses, um, gases. So, people do not want thermal power plants anymore. You cannot set up hydroelectricity projects either because you want dams. Incidentally, you should know that India is utilizing 
some 50 percent of the hydral potential. In theory, if we could build more dams, it would cost money all right, but then we could produce electricity with no problems as well as, as well as the global warming, because there what you do is water flows, runs generator, you generate electricity. But then setting up hydroelectricity, hydro, hydro projects have become a problem, because many people do not consider them to be safe. They think once you have those dams built, they can trigger earthquakes, but more important, when you build dams, firstly you displace a whole lot of people there is a question of the rehabilitation. And when that water dam collects the water, it submerges huge areas. It can submerge villages, archaeological sites, old temples, heritage buildings, roads, rice fields, all kinds of things. So, naturally many NGOs as well as government institutions do not favor building of more dams. You already know the furor that we have about Sardar Sarovar Dam. There are also furor about other dams. But hydroelectricity is one of the cheapest ways of producing electricity. Not many people know that only a few years ago, China has built one of the biggest dams ever and that is generating a substantial part, meeting a substantial part of the energy needs of vast areas of China. Now during the process of building that dam also, many people were displaced, nearly half a million, maybe more, but China has a different kind of government they can take a decision and they can implement and perhaps they can argue that for better good of the country, for good of more people, perhaps they are more efficient in rehabilitating the people who have been displaced. But in our country, I do not think we can build more hydroelectric dams. We still have to wait on thermal power plants or power plants from liquid fuels. The other option is nuclear metallurgy, nuclear reactors. Now a lot is said about that, but still they, they it's still a long way up in the future. You know, as of today, only about three or four percent of energy need of the country is met by nuclear power plants. More than twice that is being met by windmills, which many people do not know. Wind power is progressing very well in our country. And the wind power also has its disadvantages, it is seasonal and it cannot guarantee certain output all the time. When the wind blows, when the circumstances are right, it generates electricity, part of it is consumed, part can go into the grid, etcetera, etcetera. So the basic contention that I have to say is that we have the aluminum ore, but we do not have sufficient power for rapid expansion of our aluminum plants. But that is a different matter. I am not here to discuss that, but I thought you should be aware of this problem. I am here to discuss how is aluminum produced from bauxite. Before I go to that, I should say why aluminum is so important. You see aluminum everywhere. Perhaps in future you will see aluminum in many more places. Look at the cars we drive on the roads. Everybody wants that they should be more fuel efficient. How do you make a car fuel efficient? Why is a Maruti or a Nano or any small car so much more fuel efficient than the old age ambassadors and other cars? It is not because they have a more efficient engine 
more modern engine. That is one reason. But the basic reason is, on the whole, they are lighter. They are smaller cars. When the body is lighter, it needs less power, less energy to move it. Not so much when you are going on a plane or you are cruising. More important when you are climbing a hill, when you are accelerating, when you are starting from zero speed to a certain speed. That is where the weight counts. Can we not use aluminum and replace steel by aluminum? so that the car would be lighter for the same size. Now, many people think this is not possible, because aluminum apparently looks to be not so strong a metal. Like if you take a strip of aluminum, take a strip of steel, you can see steel it seems much stronger than aluminum. But what if you make the aluminum thicker? It will become stronger. Now, the strength by weight ratio for aluminum is much more than that of steel. As of now, you know, aluminum is almost 25 percent in weight, in density. Steel is four times higher. So, if you make the aluminum strip thicker, for the same weight and dimensions, aluminum piece will be stronger. Or in other words, if you want to keep the strength same, weight of aluminum required to get that strength would be less than the weight of steel will get. So, there is today a competition between aluminum and steel. <coughs> steel still has an advantage, because it is easier to produce, it is cheaper to produce, it costs less. But aluminum has a is potentially more advantageous, because it has a higher strength by weight ratio. It has another advantage. It resists corrosion, which steel does not. So, the ferrous metallurgy is trying very hard to produce steel with low alloy content. They are called low alloy, high strength steels, where for the same dimension strength will go higher. The idea is, for a lesser weight, they want to acquire higher strength, so as to compete with aluminum, if there is such a competition. Right now, there is not. But aluminum is finding many uses, where strength is not that important a criterion. Like say, we see the windows, window frames, door frames being made of aluminum, because aluminum having a low melting point is easier to cast, it is easier to be given different shapes. So, aluminum has the advantage of formability, advantage of low melting, has the advantage of corrosion resistance. Its only disadvantage is, it needs too much of energy for production as of now. Nobody has been able to come up with a process, where we will produce aluminum with substantially less energy. So, let us go to what I have written here, <coughs> that copper and aluminum are the most important non-ferrous metals. Aluminum, as I have just mentioned, finds wide uses. Most attractive properties are mechanical properties that allow rolling, extrusion, forming, machining, high strength to weight ratio, corrosion resistance electrical and thermal conductivity. These are also advantages I missed out in the beginning. Accordingly, with large number of applications, you see vessels, containers, kitchenwares, equipment for chemical and brewing industries, even milk processing, packaging. It is also not a toxic uh, substance, means you can keep milk in aluminum container and milk will be safe. So, you will see that aluminum containers used by uh, our milkmen to transport uh, milk. Alumin also are used in process processing uh, packaging, aluminum foils for example, protective surfaces, there are structural applications 
and it is also used in electrical conductors. Then there is applications in metallurgy in deoxidation. When you have oxidized steel, you add aluminum to remove that oxygen from steel. So, oxygen uh, aluminum has a wide uh, application range. In structural applications, it is potentially very important because strength by weight ratio. And many people have given calculations to show that even today, if you make a bogey, uh, a, a, say a, uh, a bogey of a locomotive of aluminum, same dimension, same strength, it will be thicker, of course. It is going to be much less energy consumer consuming in transportation. And after several years, it is going to save you energy. In the beginning, you require more energy to produce the aluminum required to make that bogey. You do not recover the money immediately, but because it is lighter, mind you, it is equally strong, but it is lighter, less fuel will be required to for its transportation. So, you will gain in transportation energy cost. After 6, 7 years, you recover and then it is gain all the way. So, some people call aluminum metal a energy bank that that is from where you can recover energy profits in the long run. Unfortunately, the world very often is not able to see things in a long distant vision. What we have is called a visual horizon. Suppose you have a car and somebody says that I will give you a gadget, it will cost you some money, but you will make the engine very efficient. But after two years, you will recover the cost. Chances are people will not buy that, because the subjective horizon means for the subject to think in that long term is absent. Uh, if we tell him that okay, it will cost you 2000 rupees, you fix that, after two months you will recover that money and then you continue to get a benefit, they might buy it. But if you tell him your subjective horizon is two years, which means you spend some 10,000 rupees now, you slowly begin to recover money. After two years, you make break even, and after that is an advantage. People are reluctant because we do not have a long subjective horizon. So, even though we may be educated, we may know facts, we may have the information knowledge people would be reluctant to invest in aluminum in a big way, assuming, accepting that it will give the benefits after 8 years only. That is another reason why it cannot find immediate application in many places. So, aluminum has to improve its act, it has to come up, come down cheaper, it has to consume less energy it has to make itself more attractive. It is attractive already. And mind you, it is corrosion resistance. It is a fantastic property. Aluminum will not be corroded. You leave it in air for months, years, it remains as it is. Why it remains as it is? Because you know, in theory, alumina, aluminum becoming alumina is a feasible reaction. But kinetically, it is not feasible because the initial oxidation and nitridation puts a coating of aluminum nitride on top of aluminum. I mean, further reaction does not take place. So, kinetically, it is not allowed. There is thermodynamic feasibility. It is not true for most steels unless you go for stainless steel, which is much more expensive. Most steels will corrode. So, aluminum is a metal of the future. If only the energy prices came down, if you learn to produce aluminum using less energy, 
nobody can stop adenium from competing very effectively with C. Where do we get aluminum from? The most common sources of aluminum are written here. They are gibbsite and diaspore. Gibbsite is written as Al2O3, 3H2O, means in the molecule there is more water. It has 65.4 percent aluminum theoretically. And diaspore is aluminum oxide containing less amount of water in the molecule, and obviously, aluminum percentage is higher. Now, you might be tempted to think that because diaspore has more aluminum, it is a better role. Fact is, that is not so. Gibbsite is a more attractive source of aluminum because eventually we have to leach this ore by a leachant sodium hydroxide and that does not leach diaspore very effectively. It is very difficult to leach. The one with more water is easier to leach. Therefore, Gibbs site actually is a more attractive raw material. By bauxite, we generally mean something which is a mixture of these two, some gibbsite, some diaspore, with various amounts of other oxides like iron oxide, TiO2, SiO2. So, Indian bauxites contain 58 to 67 percent alumina, 5 to 10 percent TiO2, low amounts of silica plus some other minor amounts of other things. And it is mixture of diaspore and gibbsite. Now, there are some deposits in India, which are that variety diaspore, aluminum content very high, but they are not technologically very attractive, because they are not very easily leachable. People would rather go for gibbsite, which has lower aluminum content. Now, the way aluminum is produced is that using this bauxite ores, which contains alumina along with other oxides, from this we produce pure alumina. Now, for that you need a hydrometallurgical process. Alumina would be leached by sodium hydroxide solution and aluminum will be taken into sodium hydroxide solution as sodium aluminate. Most of the other oxides like Fe 2 O 3, TiO 2 etcetera will not go into solution, they will remain as insolubles. When a solution is taken out, these insolubles form what is known as red mud. This red mud is a big nuisance of the aluminum industry and one of the biggest environmental issues in today's industry. The other one is fly ash, that when you produce power from thermal power plants, coal has ash, from the carbon part of coal you produce power COCO2 what is not combusted is left behind as ash, which is oxides, alumina, silica, etcetera, etcetera, etcetera. That fly ash is a problem. People are trying to use it. That is one problem. And in the aluminum industry, huge amounts of red mud that are produced, and you will see how much of red mud is produced. You can easily find out, I have said that alumina is. 58 to 67 percent Indian bauxite, Al 2 3 is 5 to 10 percent. I have forgotten to write Fe 2 3. Fe 2 3 is about 40 to 50 percent. 
the rest. So, 30 to 40 percent. So, almost a third or more of the alumina you take will produce that insoluble mass. They are simply deposited at one place. Till today, in spite of hundreds of R&D projects, nobody has found a foolproof method of using red mud. They say that in the West Indies, which has a thriving aluminum industry, every year some seven to eight soccer field size areas are used to dump red mud, which will be many feet high. They are simply dumped in dams and they are they rest there, hoping that someday will find a proper use for the red mud. In India also, where red mud is where aluminum leaching takes place, huge land areas are taken simply for dumping this insoluble mass red mud. In theory, red mud actually is a low grade iron ore because 30 to 40 or even more percentage of iron is there in that red mud. Maybe in some other countries where there is no iron ore, they will, they will think this is very attractive. But it has a problem because we do it has come out of an alkali leaching process, it contains alkalis, residual alkalis. And when you have residual alkalis in a material, it becomes very unsuitable for use either in the blast furnace or as a building material because alkalis are corrosive substances. Even if you are able to build some kind of a tiles or bricks and other things for this red mud, alkalis will create problem unless you remove the alkalis by some means. I will come to a detailed discussion of use of red mud towards the end of this course when I discuss environmental problems. But let me hint, let me just mention one tremendous idea that has been proposed by the American aluminum company Alcoa. Alcoa has suggested a process which will kill two birds with one stone. See there are thermal power plants generating power for the aluminum industry. You are generating CO2 there. The CO2 is a culprit for global warming, climate change and there are a lot of work going on how to take care of the CO2, where to dump it, how to store it. What they propose is take that CO2, put it in the red mud to neutralize the alkali because CO2 is acidic. When you put it in the red mud, it neutralizes the alkali, they will produce carbonates and then you get a mass which is ideally suited for many applications, maybe building materials. Maybe we can get out of that artificial rocks to be used in a river side, artificial coral reefs and many other things. Good in theory, but there is a problem again. The problem is very often the thermal power plants which generate power for the aluminum industry, aluminum electrolysis is far removed from where bauxite is leached for alumina production. So, how do they come together? This is the problem we have in Odisha, in say Nalco, in a place called Damunjori, that is where you are producing alumina, red mud is there. Far away in Andul near Odisha, Bhubaneswar is where aluminum electrolysis is taking place, power plant is here. Had they been closer, you can think of that CO2 going to the red mud. But anyway, there are answers to this question. And I said these are the contradictions in, in the uh, industry. Anyway, I wanted to say that the impurities that are there in bauxite 
are critical. They cannot be disposed of easily, they will give rise to red money. What is the universally adopted route to go to for aluminum production? The route is take bauxite, leach by sodium hydroxide solution and very often this leaching is done in an autoclave under pressure, so that you can go to a temperature much higher than the normal boiling point of water, to so that you can accelerate the leaching rate. You get a leach liquor, from there you precipitate alumina, then this alumina will be electrolyzed in a dissolved in a salt called cryolite, which is written as 3 NaF AlF 3 or Na 3 AlF 6. It is a natural mineral, it can be synthesized also. Now, this is a very interesting example. Generally, oxides do not dissolve in halides. Halides dissolve in halides, oxides dissolve in oxides. It is a very rare example of an oxide dissolving, not completely, to some extent in a halide. Why halide as a solvent is important? Because alumina can dissolve in a slag, but slag will be a viscous thing, it will not be easy to electrolyze. Whereas, cryolite is a salt in a molten state around 980 to 1000 degrees, alumina will dissolve in that, will electrolyze to get alumina. It is very energy intensive, about 6.5 into 10 to the power 6 kilocalories per ton is required. It also uses graphite electrodes, so it will produce COCO2 emission problem. There is no answer to this problem people are trying to find answer and I will try to tell you what kind of answers people are looking for. Now, I mentioned earlier that aluminum has an advantage, has several advantages over steel. One is high strength by weight ratio, second is corrosion resistance and this is the third one. It also has high conductivity, electrical conductivity as well as thermal conductivity. If you compare the thermal conductivity, then nobody can beat silver. Also in electrical conductivity, nobody can beat silver. I should have plot shown both the conductivities but I have put here thermal conductivity and electrical resistivity. So, conductivity will be reverse of that. You see, if you see the as a conductor, thermal conductor, silver if it is taken as a 1, copper is almost there 0 0.94, gold is 0 0.71, aluminum is 0 0.53, steel will be far below. In terms of electrical conductivity, Silver again is on top, below that is copper, below that is gold, below that is aluminum. So, aluminum is a good conductor of electrical electricity and many attempts have been made to replace copper in many electrical applications by aluminum, because copper at one time was very expensive. Perhaps you know some 20, 30 years ago. India went through a phase where the slogan was import substitution, that do not import material, substitute with indigenous material. Now, we were importing copper, so the argument was why use copper, use aluminum instead, save foreign exchange. And many researchers worked on it, they developed alloys also like one conductor was developed called PM2 conductor, which replaced copper conductors, overhead wires, many other applications. 
even transformers they tried aluminum in place of copper, not exactly pure aluminum, but aluminum alloys. But there is a catch again, copper can be very easily joined, they can be very easily in, in, in a joint together, but aluminum cannot be so easily joined, because if you try to join aluminum, at the joint aluminum oxide may occur, because aluminum oxide forms very easily, a stable oxide. So, you have to need a, an inert environment to produce a joint where aluminum oxide will not be there between two pieces. This sort of problem is not there with copper wires, where a flux will do, you can join two copper wires very easily. So, even though we tried out in this country, we have abandoned that idea. Now, that slogan is also gone. We, the now, today we know the best policy is that use the metal that is best suited for the job you have at hand and do not try to bring this substitute or that substitute, because in the long run that does not pay. Look at Japan, they have no raw materials, they only have their brain power, they are importing everything, they import the best material, the best material exactly suited for the job they want to do. So, today nobody wants to bring in aluminum again for electrical applications, aluminum are other applications. So, we either produce copper or we buy copper. So, we have got, we have abandoned that. So, the research on aluminum conductors etcetera are not as vigorous as they used to be at one time. There may be need for research in this area for some very specific applications. Anyway, coming back to this, aluminum again is attractive because of its conductivity value. Now, let us come to the question of leaching of bauxite. The process is called Bayer's process. Now, in the history, there are some very interesting coincidences. In the case of aluminum, it is quite remarkable that in the same year, somewhere in the second half of uh, 19th century, I will mention the year little later when I remember, two gentlemen in two different continents came up with the same process, Hall in America and Herold, Herold in France. So, today the electrolytic process carries both the name Hall Herold process. Somewhere I have read that these two gentlemen happened to die in the same year also, but I do not have the fact with me, but Hall and Herold proposed the same process. In the second half of 19th century, where they proposed electrolysis of alumina dissolved in cryolite. Now, fortunately, just a decade or two before that, electricity generation had become a reality. There was no electricity in the early part of 19th century. There was no question of producing aluminum in large quantity. Maybe aluminum could, could be produced in grams by very special techniques. I have heard stories of some emperors who served their guests, ordinary guests in silver and gold plates, but he had some very special guests who were other kings, he served them in plates of aluminum, because aluminum was so expensive at that time. It was produced in a very small scale. Everything changed when electricity became available in large scale. And when electricity became available, whole herald process became industrially very attractive, because then you pass electricity through a solution of alumina in cryolite, you produce alumina. That process is still continuing. It is 130 years old or something with some modification, but we have not been able to produce it. Now, that is not enough. Another very interesting coincidence took place just about that time. Aluminum electricity is required. Pure alumina, which was to be dissolved in cryolite 
it so happened a gentleman called Bayer came up with a process just about that as to how to produce large amounts of pure Al203 from bauxite. That is called Bayer's process. So three things happened more or less in, in, in about the same time, electricity availability, Bayer's process, and then Hall and Hello's process. And that established aluminum as an industrial metal. Let us start with Bayer's process. Bayer found a process of producing pure alumina by following this route. Now again, I am saying these are this is something called a flow sheet as to how you go from one step to another. I will show you many flow sheets. You do not have to remember any, but I need to give you this flow sheet because that is how processes are summarized. But I will try to tell you the whys behind this process and some story as I just said. You start with bauxite, it will be crushed ground and there will be classification. The idea will be to bring it to minus 100 mesh, then it will be leached. I have said steam and caustic soda solution, which means it is goes has to go above 100 degrees. Why above 100 degrees? Because the higher the temperature, the faster will be the leaching. But if you want to go beyond 100 degrees, you need autoclaves means pressurized vessels with no leaks. They are completely covered under pressure and today there are pressurized vessels which operate under 20, 30 atmosphere so that the boiling point goes up to above 200 degrees. So practically they become bombs. If anything happens, if there is an explosion, it is a bomb. So, it is a autoclave under high pressure. Normally, people may not go up to that, but many, many atmospheres are common 130, 140 degrees is common. So, you need injection of steam under high pressure to carry on this leaching at a higher temperature, and then finally, you get what you call a pregnant liquor. Pregnant, pregnant liquor means a liquor which contains some substance <coughs> that is allowed to settle. Settling is helped by adding starch. Starch is a settling material. It is a, it's a surface phenomenon of the things that want to settle, it coagulates, settles them. What settles is red mud. Since settling tank will separate red mud, that is discarded. As of now, we are not finding an use for red mud. If some of you can come into this area, you will find an extremely exciting area of research. Research and development, a commercial process can come out of that. Not that people are not working. In a market in India, there is a product from, from um, Formosa that they mixed with some polymers and red mud, they make pipes. So, red mud is a filler material in some polymers. Red mud has been used in making building materials, in wood substitutes, but nothing has come out in large scale in India. Now, after filtration, we are getting a liquor which is hot liquor. It will go to heat exchangers because we want to recover the heat in the liquor. Some effluents that will be discarded liquor will be cooled, then we will there will be a precipitation process. By cooling and adding some reagents, we will precipitate alumina Al203 hydrate and that goes into a rotary kiln to produce anhydrous alumina which is ready for the Hall Heroes process. So, basically this is a process of a solid dissolving in a liquid, like sugar dissolving in water. 
we want to accelerate this process. And there are people who have worked almost their whole life on just this area called Bayer's process leaching part only, how to accelerate leaching. There are people who are working only on precipitation, how to precipitate pure alumina, because this alumina will not only go for aluminum production, this alumina would also find many other applications. For example, in toothpaste, the base is fine alumina powder. Alumina will go into many medicines. Now, their requirements are different. What should be the particle size? What should be the particle shape? So, there are researchers who are working on precipitation of alumina in different particle ranges, different kinds of shapes, different kinds of purities and this kind of research is going on in JNR, DDC in Nagpur, Jawaharlal, Nehru, Aluminum, Research, Design, Research, Development and Design Center, JNR, DDC. There a whole lot of people are working only on the leaching part leaching kinetics, parameters, product characteristics, then product uses, etcetera, etcetera. We will not talk about use of alumina in other uses, but in India remember we also produce alumina for selling in the market. Some alumina fine is also exported, but bulk of the alumina that we produce is for aluminum production and that is where I am going to concentrate. Now, I mentioned it is basically a solid being dissolved in a liquid and so these are some of the things that should be understood very easily. Finer the bauxite, the better is the digestion, not only recovery with time, but speed. Weight grinding is more efficient like you know when you do an Ayurvedic medicine you prepare you all or anything you do in a mortar, you put little bit of water and grind, grinding is very efficient. So, when you are grinding bauxite to start with for subsequent leaching, it has to be weight grinding. Then temperature accelerates the reaction, we all know this. Here is an equation that has been developed, approximate equation, the rate is this depends on concentration of sodium hydroxide obviously, the stronger the sodium hydroxide concentration more is the rate and here it depends on temperature. If temperature is higher this will be more, so this will be less, so this will be more. Now, this is the activation energy and this activation it is supposed to be very high actually, which means it is very highly temperature dependent. It is also dependent on surface area of gypsum. that is why it is called A, means if you grind it more, then rate will be more. Here R is gas constant, T is absolute temperature and energy, activation energy in calorie units is high and it implies that at 100 degrees, the rate will be 150 times more than that at 50 degrees centigrade. If you go to 150 degrees, it may be 150 or more times faster. So, the higher the temperature, higher will be the rate, but higher the temperature means more pressure you need. You have to operate with higher better technologies. Many people today argue that this is unnecessary risk taking and not only risk taking more expensive because if you bring an autoclave that will operate under high pressure, you need lot more expensive reactors. They will be thicker walls, many fixtures and other things. So, there are companies which operate with much lower temperature operations almost without autoclave. They would rather go for very finer bauxite 
grind it much finer, use stronger alkali, etcetera, etcetera. So, this is an example of why one company and other company may not do the same thing. In India, there are four or five aluminum companies. They do not have the same conditions for their stresses. They have different conditions. But basically, these are the parameters. Now, there will be heat exchangers to recover sensible heat from the pregnant liquor, because liquor that is coming out of this autoclave, if the autoclave is operating at 150 degrees, the liquor will be at 150 degrees. Now, we will first cool it down, recover the heat and from the cool thing will precipitate alumina. Now, here there is a trick now. When alumina is being dissolved in by Bayer's process, it is not very selective. It is not that only alumina will dissolve, nothing else will dissolve. Some silica would also definitely dissolve. So, in the solution, you have alumina, you have small amounts of silica also. Now, so one has to be very careful now, because if you precipitate alumina, silica would also precipitate. Now, this is where a compromise has to be made between total recovery and quality. It has been found that when you start precipitating by adjusting pH etcetera, first alumina will precipitate, silica will come later. So, the idea would be to go for incomplete precipitation, which means you do not take out all alumina, but you take out alumina which is totally pure, because your fused salt electrolytic, this is process, will not tolerate impure alumina. If silica goes in there, it is not going to get electrolyzed. So, with time it will deposit in the cell, create havoc. We do not want that. We want purest alumina. So, we need to prevent precipitation of silica and to do that will be by doing incomplete precipitation of alumina. Now, there is some alumina left. What we will do? We will recirculate that. So, from what we are precipitating, we take out alumina incomplete, whatever is left will mix with the originate, so that we are not losing that alumina. Again, we will try to get alumina. Then, after we have precipitated that alumina, there will be at about 1400 degrees centigrade would be required, and for that you need a rotary kiln for efficient calcination, means you completely dry out, remove all Al 2 or 3, you break everything, aluminum hydroxide you completely break into Al 2 or 3 and all moisture at 200 degrees is totally removed. Minimum 1200 degrees C for drying of monohydrate, 800 degrees for trihydrate. So, depending on precipitate, if it is a monohydrate, it is going to require higher temperature for drying, if it is a trihydrate, lower temperature. So, these are the steps I hope you have understood that you have taken bauxite, you have leached under pressure using caustic soda, you got a liquor, the insolubles form red mud, the liquor is cooled, heat is recovered from the liquor you precipitate, incomplete precipitation of alumina and that alumina under rotary kiln would finally do this. So, there are some contradictions that higher temperature digestion mean higher rates better recovery, but higher energy in heating, more dissolution of impurities also, expenses in water clay. Normal conditions will be 130, 50 to 350 gram per liter of NaOH, temperature 150 to 220 degrees, pressure 5 to 25 atmospheres. Reaction is this, alumina to NaOH, alumina. Monohydrate is more difficult to dissolve, undissolved oxides if it were three TiO to mainly form the red mud, which is a big aluminum for the aluminum industry. Okay. I will stop here now and uh, I will proceed next time with the electrolysis uh, area. Thank you.